What's up, everybody? This is Michael M. Hotel, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. It is Thursday, October 12, 2023, and I'm here with Sister Nubia Wartford. Hotep, sister, how you doing today? Hotep, I'm doing well. And how are you, sir? Oh, I'm doing all right. It's been a busy day. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Sister Nubia is an archaeologist, um, and she's uh, working on her PhD. Uh, we're going to talk about prehistory and history of ancient Kush. Uh, to the Meroitic Queens. You've seen Sister Nubia Wartford here on the African History Network show numerous times over the years. Uh, but if this is your uh, first time finding out about her, uh, Sister Nubia Wartford is an archaeologist that studies ancient Kush, uh, K-U-S-H, okay, also uh, known as that region is also uh, consisted of Nubia. Uh, she is a cultural scientist who takes a holistic approach to studying the past. She incorporates history, excavations, past research, and comparisons to present day traditional cultures within existing ethnic groups in uh, in the area of study. Now, she has a bachelor's, bachelor's of Arts degree in anthropology and a Master's of Arts in Historic Anthropology. She was Isn't born and raised in the city of Detroit, and she became interested in geology and paleontology at the age of seven while digging in the earth and researching stones, plants, and animal fossils of Michigan. So, Sister uh, Nubia, um, this is a very interesting class uh, that you have coming up. Give us an overview. When does this class start and, and uh, tell us some of the content that you're going to cover as well? well class starts on, um, will be uh, Mondays and Thursdays, starts October 16th. Class uh, hour is 6.30 to 8.15, giving you 15 minutes here or there just for, it could go as long as 8.30 depending on um, question and answer. Okay. Um, is open to 300 students. Uh, we will um, discuss, as you said, from Karma, basically, to the Meroitic Queens. Uh, karma, basically 10,000 BC, so the prehistory, um, to 350 AD uh, through the Meroitic Queens. We'll probably cover a little bit after that, you know, the encroachment of Christianity and the change in culture and how Christianity uh, was affected or developed from um, Nile Valley uh, civilization and traditions, right. spiritual traditions. Now, just a second here. Let's see. You are in the, let me see. Hold on. Let's try this again. In the video on the broadcast, you're not coming. We can hear you, but we can't see you on oh. the actual broadcast. Okay, now you're coming through on the broadcast. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's do this. Uh, now they can see you. Okay. Uh, Okay, so let's reset. Okay, Hotep, everybody. This is Michael M. Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. It is Thursday, October 12, 2023, and we are speaking with uh, Sister Nubia Wartford, who is a uh, archaeologist, but uh, as she uh, also uh, explains herself as a cultural anthropologist. She holds a Bachelor's of Arts degree in anthropology and a Master of arts degree in historic archaeology. Uh, and she's, uh, you're working on your PhD now? Uh, right? PhD at Temple University. Yeah, she's working on a PhD in Temple University. That's where my friend, Dr. Malefe Ketia Asante is. We just had uh, Dr. Asante here on the African History Network show in, um, it was April. It was April, 2023. We were discussing uh, Queen Cleopatra VII and the uh, anti-Black uh, sentiments coming out of Egypt uh, and all of that, all of that controversy. Uh, Sister Nubia Wartford is an archaeologist that studies ancient Kush. And we know th that region in ancient times was um, also referred to as Nubia. Uh, she is a cultural scientist who takes a holistic approach to studying the past. She incorporates history excavations, past research, and comparisons to present-day traditional cultures within existing ethnic groups in the area of study, okay? Now, I have seen some, I'm just telling you, I have seen some of her presentations in person, 
and her presentations are are bad. And in my teachers are Dr. Leonard Jeffries, Professor Jane Small, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, uh, Dr. Ray Hagens, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Claude Anderson, things like this. And I was good friends with Ahati Kalindi E. We both knew Ahati Kalindi E. So I know real scholars when I see them. Okay, she's a real scholar. I'm telling you right now. Um, uh, she was born in and raised in the city of Detroit, and Sister Nubia became interested in geology and paleontology at the age of seven while digging in the earth and researching stones, plants, and animal fossils of Michigan. Okay, so uh, Sister Nubia, so the name of this class is uh, Prehistory and History of Ancient Kush to the Merowictic queens okay so give us an overview of this class and she's also spoken to my class for the uh for the online history class that i teach she's spoken to us as well so people love her teachings give us a, a brief overview of this class um this class will go from karma on um, civilization from like 10,000 bc um okay. to um 580 so we'll take you all the way from uh, the unknown to the known Okay, from the unknown to the known. Okay, so when we talk about, so let's let's start. Uh, uh, let's go back and look at the beginning here. And um, you know, you you've been on our show before. You've talked about uh, Kush. You talked about Nubia. Things of this nature. Tell us the difference. Let, let, let's start for people who may not be familiar with any of this information. We hear a lot about Egypt. We hear about Kemet. Okay, not as much about Kush. Tell us what was Kush? K U S H. What was Kush? Kush was a civilization, um, what would be considered the upper Nile River. Um, and because of the flow of the Nile River going from, from north to uh, from, from north to south, which okay. in, in the southern orientation where the world they looked at the world differently, basically determined, determined by their surroundings and their world was based on their surroundings and the flow of the Nile River. And the culture is thought to come up the Nile River, of course, and you know, and spread out from Nile River. The Nile Valley civilization is not only just Egypt, not only just Kush, not only just Sudan, Egypt, today's Egypt, yesterday's Kemet, today's um, Sudan, yesterday's Kush, Meroe, Ta-Nehisi, Mm -hmm. It was all the surrounding areas which were a part of that Nile Valley culture and contributed to the development of it. We we're talking about um, we're talking about Mali. We're talking about um, uh, Uganda. We're talking about Chad. We're talking about the Republic of the Congo. We're talking about Eritrea, Ethiopia, Kenya, um, all of these, all of these Zimbabwe. Even uh, we're talking about all these cultures that 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 evolved from the Nile River, from the Nile River civilization, feeding the cultures, feeding the traditions in right. all of those African places. Now we have it today where the usurpers of the traditions that live there today, um, the Arabics that live there today, which claim the culture, um, mm -hmm. don't uh, connect the Africanity to it. We, th those people themselves did not call the land Africa, but they did relate to the cultures that surrounded um, the area. Um, they, they had no question that they were related to the um, cultures that surround that, even as far as Le the Levant. So the people understood what information fed the culture. Okay. So when does the, and Kush is a, was a region more so than say a country. OK, mm -hmm. and within Kush, we're going to have like uh, karma that's going to come to come into existence. I think around somewhere around 300 B.C. or so, we're going to have what, what, karma, what is karma? The, karma culture is actually mm -hmm. 10,000 years old. That's karma, part of the okay. prehistoric. Mm -hmm. OK, karma is prehistoric. OK, karma culture. OK, now we're going to have like uh, Meroway. We're going to have all this within this region. Of Nubia. Kush. Okay. So when we now within Kush, we're going to have what we would call what different empires because the you because the geographical boundaries that we see today in Africa largely come from the Berlin Conference of 1884 to 1885. That in, in ancient times, we didn't have those geographical boundaries, those same mm -hmm. generally speaking. So uh, 
um, what, go ahead. Well, the, 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 the cultures that you have there can be said, now, Kush was definitely an empire. There were times where Kushite civilization overtook ancient Egypt. Okay, uh, right. You know, specifically in the tw 25th dynasty that starting with Pianchi and um, Shabaka right. in right. that line that goes to Taharqa, um, that that civilization definitely took over. Um, but there's not been a place, there's not been a time up to the third, almost the 30th dynasty, I say at least the 27th dynasty, that ancient Kushites did not, were not involved in the culture. They were so closely related, their culture is so very closely related, it's hard in some times to, dis, to make the distinction between Kushite culture and Egyptian culture, especially in the 25th dynasty when um, Taharqa's mission and his family's mission was to revive the ancient culture. So mm -hmm. you see definitely a marrying of the cultures where Amen, who is the, who is the, is the top tier um, spiritual representatives in this culture that he takes form. And that's where you get the name Amen at the end of sentences from Amen and Amen Ra. Um, we know come from the, from the mountain that's called Tua, which we call Jebel Barco, but the ancient right. uh, Tua or Twa which we, you know, can probably relate it to the Twa people at some point in time. But that's not been proven. That's just another theory that these names that we are calling these people are definitely related to some prehistoric activity. Even the, um, going to the first going to the first dynasty um, where we see Mernit as a queen and we, we, we have um, we have um, Narmer or, you know, as the first as the first Pharaoh, that culture goes all the way back down and across to the Levant culture. Even the even the uh, what they call the Narmer palettes are shaped just like the Levant. And that has some that's basically trying to tell us their origins. Okay. All right. Now with uh we know that the uh capital is moved to Meroe around 300 bc or so somewhere yes. around there okay now where when does meroe come into uh existence about what period of time meroe is coming into it's coming into existence about 350 bc and stays in place to about 500 a.d i mean as far as the known known place of it the location of it um so these meroitic clean queens are, are functioning in there like on their, you know, on top, you know, by 30 BC at the same time when Cleopatra was was around, you have these these queens. So you have the queen of of of, of Asaba, which is uh, which is which is which is uh, Makeda, who's around. Yeah. These queens are run that that are functioning, and they are regnant queens where they are reigning. They they didn't inherit it from their husband. The lineage goes through them. So there's 300 Meroe, there's 350 years of leadership by women. And that's, you know, that's not something that, that came into existence before this time, that we know that the women were in existence and they were leading the culture, followed directly by what we know of the queens, the European queens, which had these queens that were functioning and running the societies. And but it started off in Africa because of their egalitarian thinking um, that women were just as worthy as as, as men to uh, run a civilization. In fact, uh, in, in, in Sudan today, there are seven court justices are seven women in the Supreme Court. So these traditions of education, of leadership exist today. Okay, now, when we talk about now there there are uh, uh, more pyramids today in uh, Sudan than there are in Egypt, basically. And when we talk about um, Nubia in uh, ancient times, we're talking about basically the lower portion, the southern portion of Egypt today and the upper portion of Sudan. Historically, you know, that was uh, what we call Nubia. Um, and you've talked about like in your lectures and I've seen in other presentations how the design of the pyramids in uh, 
Nubia were um, different than than the pyramids that we would see in ancient Kemet. Uh, the, mm -hmm. the 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 width of the base and things like this, right? Mm -hmm. Can you talk talk for a minute about the different? Talk for a minute. One, approximately how many pyramids are in Sudan in relationship to uh, uh, Egypt, and um, and then what, what's the difference in the design as well in the two pyramids? Well, the count has gone up. There's over 285 mm -hmm. pyramids now. Right. Uh, some of the pyramids have been dismantled, but you see evidence of the bases. So the count is up to 285. I presume in, in that Sudan. Yeah. In Sudan. Mm -hmm. But I presume that uh, under some of those dunes that we, you know, once we start doing more um, scans and, uh, you know, photo aerial photography with drones, that we're going to find more bases to these pyramids. The, the pyramids were dismantled and people used them in modern architecture, whether it's their house or buildings and things. They took those stones and they reused them. Um, not having uh, the, you know, the, 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 the cultural, no longer having the cultural connection to um, the ancient culture because the mainstream culture, at least in Northern Sudan, is, uh, is, is Islam. But right. in, in southern Sudan, which has now been divided in a country as of, as of 2011, um, there is more uh, consistency with the traditions to the ancient culture. And there's probably, South Sudan is pregnant uh, and ready for, for, for archaeological excavation because there's a lot of remaining information there. That is that is virgin territory as far as archaeological research, and I think we're going to find a lot of a lot of information. Um, 97 percent of 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 the of, of the archaeological sites have not been recovered. Period. Right. Right. You know, you can walk around in the desert in Sudan and find an archaeological site just um, brushing your feet in the sand. I, I remember you saying that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found two just walking around in the, in the sand. And you can you can actually see archaeological sites all over the desert. So you know, um, just as you this 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 report says, thirty five ancient pyramids discovered in Sudan in, in Sudan is is that this is this is going to continue to happen because right. it's the antiquity of that civilization. We know that the civilization was there at least ten thousand BC, but we also know now that humanity in that area goes back nearly a million years over 750,000 years, we know that there are homo sapiens. Now the debate is homo sapien, sapien, or homo sapien, but there are people that are doing gold mining and um, creating artifacts 750,000 years ago, far beyond any other civilization in the world. Okay, now when we look at um, like this article here, this is from Scientific American, and I remember when this discovery came out, uh, this article is from uh, February 6, 2013. Uh, 35 ancient pyramids discovered in Sudan. 35 ancient pyramids discovered in Sudan, built during the height of the Kush kingdom. Okay, this is what we're talking about. A group of 2,000-year-old pyramids resemble uh, French formal gardens. And briefly here, it says at least 35 small pyramids along uh, with graves have been discovered, uh, have been discovered clustered closely together at a site uh, called, uh, how do you pronounce that, Sedinga? Uh-huh. Sedinga in Sudan, uh, discovered between 2009 and 2012. Uh, researchers are surprised at how densely the pyramids are concentrated. Uh, in one field uh, season alone in 2011, the research team discovered 13 pyramids uh, packed into roughly 5,381 square feet uh, or slightly larger than an NBA basketball court. They date back around 2,000 years to a time when a kingdom named Kush flourished in Sudan. Kush shared a border with Egypt, Egypt and later on the Roman Empire. The desire of the kingdoms, the desire of the kingdom's people to build pyramids was apparently influenced by Egyptian funerary 
funerary, uh, funerary architecture. So talk about the which for, for people who aren't familiar with this type of information, which came first, uh, Kush or Kemet? Kush came, Kush came first. Um, ancient Kush or the some of the um, ancient kings in the area or leaders in the area, one of the most ancient names is Kesh. And um, it is thought that the name Kush comes from his name, Kesh, the land of Kesh or Kush. Yeah. And it how came, are you spelling Kesh? Is that K-E-S-H? K-E-S-H. Okay. So it's thought that, you know, that the name of Kush comes from that, that he was the king of Kesh. And so we're not sure if that was his title or his name. Um, Meroetic script has yet to be totally deciphered. There is a French uh, French linguist called Claude Rilly who is working on it. Uh, also, Dr. Ben Levy. Um, in Chicago has also done some significant work on um, on Meroetic script. Oh, Pro and Professor has, Joseph Ben Levy. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We know him. Yeah, yeah. You and I know uh, Professor Ben Levy. He's spoken here in Detroit mm -hmm. uh, back about 2013, 2014. He and Dr. Ricketti, I'm in. Yes. Yeah. And so okay. they they're they're you know they're doing some work. Uh, him and Ricketti are working together to 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 decipher some of those scripts. So the race is on who is going to totally dis decipher it. They know the names of of, uh, of leadership, the, the the kings and queens and years, but the script in between, they're not sure. They're, uh, they're looking for a Rosetta Stone type of uh, artifact that can tell a little bit more about uh, the language system there, and it could be deciphered to in total. Okay, now... Uh... How far, when we talk about ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet, okay, Kemet meaning the land of the blacks, how, uh, you said Kush is older than Kemet. Definitely. How old is Kemet? What, what what period of time does Kemet come into existence? And then tell us again, how old is, is Kush? Ancient Kemet, once again, um, there, when you, when you see the, the, the history of them, there mm -hmm. it's coming into existence between six and eight thousand BC. Right. Okay. Which be, before six thousand BC, that's called the prehistoric period. But there there's activity in right. ancient Kim, Kemet at that point. But they are calling themselves um, Kemetu, the the scorpion king who is a king before them that they think is possibly uh, Pharaoh Din or King Din D E N um, is you know, it's beyond 6,000 years. I'd say between eight and 6,000 years. And there yeah. are heroes that are missing in all of the dynasties. We don't know each um, leader. And there's a lot of missing information about the culture, about the traditions in ancient Kemet and a, a plethora of information that is missing out of ancient Kush. So you could say that that culture, that ancient Kemet, 6,000, you know, 6,000 BC, came into existence with the first uh with the first pharaoh that that would be uh, oh that would be that would be aha that would be men uh, uh, um aha uh, yeah, yeah, uh -huh. namer yeah namer um so usually they put the unification of upper and lower kemet right around 3200 well, bc somewhere right around there yeah, around the first around the first dynasty, and that's yeah. that's the first family that they have documented. But the prehistory right. says before yeah. there are monuments in Kemet that are prehistoric still, right? Uh, that that have not been uh, assigned to a dynasty to a person that built it. Um, so there's a lot of mystery going on. And then after the before that is Kermit Kerma, which we find um, that civilization. On top of it is an 8,000 year old civilization, and underneath that is a 10,000 year old civilization. So, okay. got, yes. Go ahead. Go ahead. So, we have, so we know that that civilization is 10. I found an artifact that was, um, I think I've shown you that, and we'll be showing that in my class a piece of ceramics that the, the ceramist from Russia said that this is between 10 and 12,000 BC. And she said, you know, it's impossible. I'll never forget that. She was walking around in a daze 
Nubia, what you found is impossible. I said, it's very possible. Svetlana, it's in your hand. And I said that exactly to her. And she looked, she she walked around with that for at least four or five hours, you know, because she the antiquity of the civilization was just sinking in. Um, right. That 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 site was the was the African archaeological site of the decade, because right. um, it, what we found there was cutting edge. We found a a sliding door, a door that pivoted like a modern um, door. You know, you could see where the grooves were that were very modern. Uh, we found um, we found the 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 temple that had been toppled over. The first uh, representative of Osset, which um, this originally floated down the, the river to be venerated in, in Kemet, um, mm -hmm. 350, 500 AD. So people were venerating um, the, the, the spiritual system of ancient, of ancient Kush far into Christianity. So people today still hold on to their culture inside of Islam, inside of Christianity, just uh, we call it, we call it like the the Kojic church, you know what I mean? Right. That, all that African stuff that's inside of the church, they they embedded it inside of there as to not suffer any persecution because it was the same type of persecution that we can say that uh, people experience here in the United States when forced to change their religion because everybody in the area, the Romans, had influenced the Ethiopians, which were practicing a similar to Christianity, so it was not difficult to change them over to Christianity because they had similar things in place. Um, and as you know, uh, the the evolution of that slowly taking those black figures, um, Aset, Asir, and Heru out right. and replacing them, and where they took the black woman out of the spiritual system, that's where you find the Holy Ghost. You know what I mean? I call it the hole in the spiritual system. Right, exactly. Um, and we see the we see the worship of the Black Madonna and Child in Europe even before the African Moors going in in seven eleven A D. Mm -hmm. They were worshiping the the, the uh, Black Madonna and Child uh, all all throughout Europe and France. Coming from the research from um, our friend who's not ancestor uh, Renoko Rashidi, France probably has the most. Uh, representations of the Black Madonna and Child, which is which is around 300 between paintings and statues, as as he talked about in his book, uh, Black Star: The African Presence in Early Europe. And the, uh, Eiffel, and the Eiffel Tower is representing um, Osset. It's called the Black Lady because the Eiffel Tower actually represents that lady. And there was worship of Osset before mm -hmm. Notre Dame. They were worshiping Osset there. Paris is actually means the House of Isis. Yeah, House so, of Isis. Yeah, so, Para Isis. Yeah, those is like they're Para building Isis. those those temples and churches right on top of right. um, what was worshipped before. So all this is Nile Valley civilization that lands there. I would say that it came in through the Roman influence. Um, you know, uh, you know, when, at, at the beginning of, of the the contact with with Rome and in in the French and the Germans. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so the Notre Dame Cathedral, when no, Notre Dame means Our Lady, number one, That's number right. two, is built on the remains of what used to be a temple dedicated to all set or ice. That's right. OK, so we got to we have to peel back the layer of European culture and you find African culture behind that. OK, we, and, that, we, and that's what that's what this class is about. My first section is the poison of the white racist school of archaeology is mm -hmm. because you know the first section let's this you know we're gonna we're gonna peel off all of that the first section whatever you thought you know we're gonna we're gonna show you how white racism affected academia and has blinded um the way that people even view things for george right. reisner to come into kush and uh do First of all, he he was hanging people uh, to get information for the. Who, who was hanging people? George White Reisner was hanging people. Okay. In in, in Sudan, okay. you know the white racist people and all that kind of thing. But the but he was also saying that black people did not create these things. These things that he's finding came from some Caucasian uh, mystery uh, people that came and they built these wonderful structures. 
and left these wonderful culture, which they found jewelry, they found fashion, they found um, books, they found, you know, scrolls, they found a culture that was in place. And right. the oral history, you can go to the people now, the people, many of the people, especially the people that are out into the rural communities, they know their history. They have, yeah. they have historians and who um, can tell you about their family history. Each one of them can say, well, no, there was, there was, there were regents in this area. There were women governors that are like governors and they ran each one of these areas and they was reported to the queen. You know what I mean? So they had their system set up. Um, uh, um, Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Usman Ali, who is Ali Usman, excuse me, Dr. Ali Usman, who uh, was the gentleman I wanted to study to under a uh, university of Khartoum. He was the one who discovered a school dedicated to women. One of my, one of my other points um, that I'm very interested in is, 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 is the, how the, the world actually worshiped um, the most high in the form of women, women. I, mm -hmm. I, I leave out the word God, um, that's commonly used because people didn't use the word God. They used the most high because literally they're talking about the most high in the sky, the, the, the person, the thing, the, the, the power that created the universe and how scientific um, these deities are. We're going to get into that in the class. Right. Um, the next no. section we'll do is the prehistory of ancient um, Kerma in Uganda and the Nile Valley. And we'll talk about these spiritual systems. In the now, connections. Now, what period of time are you talking about when African people use the term most high to refer to the supreme being or what people today are taught to call God? That That's all all the way up to probably 500 A.D. The well, word, no, I mean, going back how far? Like, oh, um, before writing. Before, before writing. Before so, writing um, the the Seshet, who is the mm -hmm. woman who created, uh, who created Medu Nature. Sesh is, is, is the Medu Nature word for scribe. So Seshet, the woman who created language. She's creating this about six, at, at the first dynasty. So about the 6,000 years. Right, right around three, uh, right around 3000 BC or so. Right. BC. About 30, 36, 38. 36, you know, 38, okay, right around. But that, she that is, time. She's, she's existed. They call her the lady of numbers. She also, mm -hmm. she's venerated as the person when you, it's, when you have to build a, a building or temple, you have to venerate her because she's going to make sure you, all the accuracy is there, you know, all the measuring, all the accuracies and she uh, created language. So, you know, Sashet is a very important woman. And I would, I would think that many of these women are rolled in over time. The names changes, the the, right. the names change, the stories more gets added onto them. I would say that Neat, Sachet, and Osset are probably rolled into one by the time you get to probably about uh, 2000 BC, that they're all rolled into one and all of their attributes are similar. Okay. Now tell people when your class starts um, uh, how many sessions there are and how they can register for it. Okay. There are nine sessions. Um, I have nine se sessions where, um, we're having a class Mondays and Thursdays. You can okay. register for the class by just, uh, emailing me at N W A R D F O R D at hotmail.com. That's my name in Wardford in for Nubia, Wardford, W-A-R-D, F is in Frank, O-R-D, at hotmail.com. We're going to put it here on the screen also. Go ahead. And then you put the title of the course and the subject, just say Kush course, and I'll send you all the information. There are payment plans um, available and discounts for teachers, seniors. Uh, we have those in students. Um, and whatever it is, we're going to make it affordable for you. The, okay. the object is to make sure that this information gets out and that our people are beginning to understand that that we are connected with it. The, the question that I get most from people uh, and, and people don't understand, they say, well, what does ancient Kemet and what does that Nile Valley stuff have to do with us today? Right. Well, when we were inundated with all these different cultures, 
we began to migrate elsewhere to West Africa. And there you go. There's the connection. When I walk in, when I go to, to Sudan, if I don't open my mouth, guess what people do? They come up to me, and they start talking to me in their language. We mm -hmm. are the same people. I mean, I have had people tell me that um, you, you're not, you know, your parents aren't from America. You're not telling the truth because they just think that, you know, I'm just saying, no, ma'am, my, my mother's from Mississippi and my father's from Tennessee. And they said, well, where is that? Where's that strange land? We don't, we don't know where that is because that's the connection. Um, people, as they're getting their DNA tests, um, they're getting their DNA tests that say that they're from West Africa, but depending on the DNA pool that they use to, you know, for those tests, you're not getting it. But the DNA pool for uh, many people, they're coming up, they're from Egypt by way of West Africa. West African cultures, when I first visited Ghana, the people showed me their totems, which were are the their burial sites, which represent each one of their ancestors. And they said, and those, and this is the first time I heard it, those in back, those in back came from Egypt. Now this came from the people, from the historians, from the chiefs, from the from from the historians in the in the griots that are there that actually tell the history of each ethnic group and i was i was floored and then i saw elements of the culture that are definitely um nile valley civilization um i have a friend whose last name is low well i've met several of the low family in sudan okay. and he said, oh the low family is from ancient because i said yeah i've met some lows and they looked very similar to him. If I if I showed you a picture of him and uh, the lower part of his face and, and mashed it up with, with uh, King Tut, you couldn't tell the difference from King Tut's facial structure than this brother from Sudan. So we are the same people. Um, DNA is showing us um, that right now. I mean, it is de definitely proving what the people way back in 1996 first told me my first visit to Ghana. Wow. Um, you mentioned the uh, relationship between um, ancient Kemet and African-Americans today or the Nile Valley region of Africa. Um, and this is it's important to really understand this history. This in, this includes um, ancient Kush uh, as well. And the reason why is is because um, so many so many African Americans have been our understanding of history oftentimes can be shaped by roots, mm -hmm. roots the ministry, Kuta Kente. And mm -hmm. even though the transatlantic slave trade is part of our history, it's not the totality of our history. So we uh, a lot of people don't understand how African people migrate from the Nile Valley region of Africa into Central Africa, into West Africa. And um, when we look at Ghana, Ghana comes into existence uh, somewhere around like 300 BC. Um, there's a relationship between when, you know, Dr. David M. Hotep, who, um, you know, just yeah. recently passed away in the past few weeks. Okay. Um, Dr. David M. Hotep talks about how the Dogon of Mali uh, were originally in ancient Kemet, okay? Mm -hmm. The Dogon mm -hmm. who are in Mali and Burkina Faso. Uh, the Yoruba were originally in ancient Kemet as well. And there was a there was an African-American man. There was a story, uh, Tony Browder. We both know, uh, we're both friends with Tony Browder. Uh, Tony Browder wrote uh, this landmark book, Now Valley Contributions to Civilization, uh, one of my favorite books. <laughs> and I use this, I just interviewed Browder in... Uh, in April 2023, I use uh, that book in uh, my classes also. Um, Tony sent me a video. Um, it was an interview with this uh, brother named uh, Dexter Caffey. Okay. And this video is on YouTube. I'm trying to find the um, article on it because I don't want to uh, show the video here because I don't want this uh, to get flagged. But Dexter Caffey is an African American businessman. And he did his, did a DNA test, and his DNA test discovered that he is a direct descendant of um, uh, Nasubiti or Pharaoh Ramses the Third. Okay, he's a direct descendant of Ramses the Third, and his 
he actually looks like up when we look at statues of uh, uh ramses the third he actually looks like him as well so and it, this is important to understand this connection because i i know uh i've heard dr henry lewis gates jr say and i'm not a big fan of gates but he i, I tell people he does do some good research when it he, comes it, to it, like yeah, we got it. We got to respect do some his good work. research when it comes to say African American history, things like this. Ancient ancient Africa is not his. That's not his area of expertise. But I've heard him say, "Well, the 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 pyramids in ancient Egypt don't have anything to do with African Americans because most of the slaves came from West Africa." I've heard him say this, and I'm like, "What the hell are you talking about? African people didn't stay put." Okay, I mean, the, I mean, the, the, the we have articles from face to face africa.com that talk about the um in um uh in in Asia, but specifically, uh, they talk about uh the Negritos in I can't remember exactly which country it is, but those were originally African people. Okay, we didn't stay put, so um, give us the date and time that your class is going to be as well you mentioned october 16th but you didn't say what time tell us what time your class is october going to be. 16th mondays and thursdays from 6 30 p.m est eastern okay. standard time to 8 15 eastern standard time you can join the class by emailing me at in wordford at hotmail.com put in the title kush course or course so mm -hmm. that I'll know, so that I can sort you out um, from the junk mail that I receive. So okay, gonna, push uh, course. Okay, that's and, what I wanted. Uh, okay, yeah. so we'll put this. We'll put, we'll put your uh, email address back up, and then um, uh, Kush course and subject. yeah, put that in okay. the subject area. Mm -hmm. And then we'll talk about. It. I'm not going to turn away anybody who wants to take this class. I'm going to tell you. Um, that we will, we want the, the idea of me doing this is so that you can trace your fifth, your history down in your family. History needs to be a family affair. Everybody mm -hmm. in every household, somebody should know something about their ancient history. We know we're from Mississippi. We know we're from Tennessee. We know we're from Bama. Okay, but we had a home before those, and there are there is evidence as my as brother David and Hotep has certified that we were here. There's evidence in the in the, in Detroit, Michigan, the Detroit Institute of Arts, that in the basement, there is an ancient Egyptian burial that was found on Mountain Road in 10, 11 mile, somewhere right. in that area. Um, and it was an ancient Egyptian burial and it looks like a royal burial that somebody from the royal family around the 18th dynasty um was was making a, a voyage over here and passed away they have the gold burial mask that was buried in one of those mounds so we know there's a connection that this mound culture actually relates back to ancient egyptian culture in some way um, right. that you know we know that you know there were pyramids that are, that exist at different places in the united states some of them have submerged. Some of them are in the coast of Cuba. Some of them are in Japan. That these people, even in Sarajevo, um, um, we know that there are three pyramids that are covered up by trees that the uh, that the Bosnians will not let people do research on because that you know what they're going to find. They don't want the research to be done because they're going to find black people. And there were black people living in Eastern Europe um, a long time ago as well. Black people, as Renoko Rashidi has found out, are the are the founders of the world that right. existed all over the world and all different places. And if you go back to the traditional history of the of the First Nations picture, people they in their iconography they have the black or brown bear, which represents the ancestor. That represents black people. That when they came here, they found black people, and that. If you talk to them, all of them will say the same thing if they're a journalist. Exactly. So, exactly. You know what I mean? This, 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 you know, we have to pull the, the, the white hood off of history because it's been usurped. It's been it's been, been clanized. That's what I tell tell it. You know, they didn't put the white hoods all over history, and now we gotta take them off. And this is what this class is about. 
Right. And it's interesting that we were having this conversation on October 12th because this is the commemoration of um, Columbus landing in what, right. we called, uh, what, what we call today the Bahamas, or he called San Salvador, which means Saint Savior. And um, there were African people um, in some of those areas that he went to. Um, and we know that uh, he had, he was. Uh, using nautical instruments based upon technology that the Moors introduced into Europe, like the Astrolay. Uh, and on some of his ships, we know he had Moors navigating some of his ships as well. Yes, so yes. it's important to under, it's important for us to study. Some people want to cast aside Christopher Columbus. It's true he never came to the land we call the United States of America. The closest he came here was Cuba, which is 90 miles away. But uh, Columbus is essential crucial to understanding the spread of slavery, racism, capitalism, and the exploitation of indigenous people. And it also further connects us to the history of the Moors in Europe, especially Spain. Um, and because the, the Moors lose control of their last stronghold, Granada, January 2nd, 1492, and uh, Columbus sets sail uh, for the so-called New World, August 3rd, 1492. So in the same year, the, the, all that stuff is connected. But the Moors connect us to the Nile Valley region of Africa because they're taking the teachings from the Nile Valley region of Africa into Europe. And these teachings help bring Europe out of the dark ages, but it's to our detriment. Um, so you, we have your class starting up October 16th. We want to give a shout out to Brother Enoch uh, Hankerson, who's watching, Jerome McMillan here in Detroit is watching. And uh, the Big Swarm uh, digs as well. Philippines was the country I was thinking of uh, where you had the Negritos. Um, you have you, you have you have black people in all of those places. I mean, all those have, places. Yep. All of those places. Another thing is is that uh, along with studying ancient uh, Sudan, mm -hmm. um, as I do underwater archaeology, I hope to work with Ayana and Donovan um, to you know do underwater archaeology in the Caribbean. In some other places too, because one of my interests is resistance archaeology as well, which a okay. lot of the resistance archaeology evidence lays on the bottom of oceans and things like that on the shores of the Caribbean, but also the the the, the Omic and the Belize. I'm I'm, yeah. I'm doing research with uh, Dr. Stan Walling, and and we are studying uh, the water reservoirs that are collected by the that that were constructed by the Maya people. Well, you can't tell where the Maya civilization starts in the Omic ends because they they incorporated um, the Omic civilization that it pre-existed um, their migration. But that civilization has so many different so many different aspects of it that are definitely connected with ancient Egypt. Yeah, um, there's a lot of it. I mean, even the you know, and, and goes back to ancient. Uh, I believe that the that the that the tree, the Saba tree, is represented first in ancient Egypt as Osiris, um, the king of the of the overworld and the older world, and that that tree from Voodoo. All of these things can be traced on back to ancient Egypt and travel around wherever we went. We took our culture. Tony Browder also discovered Indinka symbols, which I have on top. He discovered that there was a Sankofa symbol in the 25th dynasty. That's the first time anybody, that's a huge find, has right. made a direct connection to West Africa, to ancient Egypt. So just wouldn't, so he in the physical, there's there's a debate between archaeologists and historians. Um, you know, historians say you don't need archaeologists. Archaeologists say you don't need historians. You, we need them both. Because right. archaeology has the evidence, has the physical evidence of the documentation that the historians have. And if we could stop these silly um, debates and who's more important than the other, you know, very Eurocentric. You know, that's why we come from a holistic approach. Well, I need paleontologists. I need chemists. I need yeah. archaeologists. I need historians. I need all of that to make sure that we are telling this story in the most truthful light as possible. Exactly, exactly. And I, I look at a lot of that information from different sources and look at the archaeology, look at the history, paleontologists as well. And there's so many, there's so many discoveries that are coming out, you know, <laughs> are coming out on a weekly basis. You mentioned, um, I want to, I want to, uh, I want you to talk briefly about some of your other class sessions that you have, because you have uh, nine class sessions, I think you, I think you yes. said nine. Okay. 
But you mentioned Tennessee. Yes. Okay. <laughs> now, a lot of people don't know this. And yeah. I, I deal with this in my classes and people are blown away by this. A lot of people don't know this. Yeah. And who was who one of the first people that discussed this with you? Oh, uh, you. <laughs> but I did. I did additional research and I found this here. Right. Yeah. OK, so there's a so people hear the word Memphis, Tennessee. And right. they hear Memphis in Egypt. Right. And then people wonder, well, it, you know, is there a connection between the two? OK, yes, there is. OK, so in, in doing in my research, uh, I came across the University of Memphis, which is in Memphis, Tennessee. And they have a at the University of Memphis, they have an institute of Egyptian art and archaeology. OK, now this is Memphis.edu. This is the university's website. OK, so it, right here, they have brief history of the IEAA. That's the uh, Institute of uh, Egyptian Art and Archaeology. And they talk about the founding of Memphis, Tennessee and a relationship to Memphis, Egypt. And they say the city of Memphis, Tennessee has always had a special connection to its ancient namesake, Memphis, Egypt. The American city, Memphis, Tennessee, was founded in 1819 by General, later President Andrew Jackson, that white supremacist President Andrew Jackson, General James Winchester and, Ju and Judge John Overton. And, and they say, based on its strategic position at the head of the Delta of the Mississippi River, sometimes called the American Nile. So, so the Mississippi River is sometimes called the American Nile River. The city of Memphis, Tennessee, was named after the ancient capital of Egypt, uh, which was located at the head of the Nile River Delta. OK, so mm -hmm. this is where Memphis, this is why Memphis, Tennessee is called Memphis. OK, right. and it's in relationship to ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. Go ahead, Sister Nubi. And the other thing is, as you know, um, Memphis means the beautiful city mm -hmm. or the beautiful land. Right. And Tennessee was was thought to be one of the most majestic places in the United States. Um, and it's called Ta-Nehisi. Yes. I mean, Tennessee and Ta-Nehisi has have. Now, there's a debate whether Ta-Nehisi Ta meant land of the snakes or land of you know, or what it what it means, because it's an ancient language. Or land but of the Tennessee, serpent. I'm like that. Yeah. But, but but Tennessee has was also named had more snakes in it than any other state. And mm. the ta Hesse, um, that the people, that the people, that the ancient people that lived there, um, there's a connection to the name ta Hesse and named it Tennessee. Because the people that lived there before the, 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 the white folks that settled the land, the Europeans, they named that area Tennessee. So it's not even known now. They have, now you'll see, um, but it wasn't known until just fairly recently what Tennessee meant, what were the origins of that name, um, just coming out that I think there's a there's a there's an ancient language that they're equating it to. I mean, you know, as you anytime you dig deep, you're going to come up with us, even Michigan, yeah. Mi Michigan with the Ojibwa. We have Taquana Mon Falls, which means land of the God, water god Amen right in Michigan, okay? So the Ojibwa people who are people who pretty much look like um, the man you sit here looking at right mm -hmm. now, like um, brother David, Michael and Hotep, right. you know, in the uh, Ojibwa people, um, you know, are the people that name these rivers, you know, Michigan. So that was a Native American nation. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah okay. Yeah, and and what's it, uh, Ojibwa? Ojibwa is the name Ojibwa. is bastardized into Chippewa. Chippewa, you're right, right, yeah. Okay, yeah. but it is the Ojibwa people, and those people were also the people that handed off um, that that traded Mackinac Island for uh, for uh, the, the the Baptiste, who is the founder of Chicago. Yeah. All right, yep. because they said, Not, "Oh uh, no, you can't come and take our brother back to slavery." It's thought that he came from Haiti. May mm -hmm. have come from Haiti. It's yeah, not John Baptiste, ever yeah. not sure, but they considered him their brother, and he could speak. Uh, he could speak Ojibwa. He could speak French. He's a very. He's a mystery man. I really would like to find out more about him, but he's not around here to tell his story. Right. But 
he he ended up in Michigan from Haiti, you know what I mean, and ended up with the Ojibwa people, which probably had some hand in getting him here through these through these waters called the Great Lakes. If you know, because you can take the Great Lakes around the Florida, and through Florida you can get to where we you can get to get to Haiti, right? Right. Get so, to Haiti. Um, yep. So you know what I mean. That's my that's the Nubian theory. You know, Michael knows I always have these theories, but um, <laughs> yeah. there's no proof of this. But it but it makes sense because right. the Native Americans seventy five was created from the native from the Ojibwa people and all of those um, traditional people going from the up north Michigan down south to Florida for you know for the winter time. They didn't stay up north. They weren't crazy. They didn't stay up north in the winter when it goes gets to be 40 below zero, 30 below zero. They went to, to the sun in Florida and they came back up to Michigan and to enjoy the beauty of Michigan because Michigan, you know, big water, still water is the um is one of the most beautiful places in the world in in, in uh in the summer. You said you said that's how 75 was created. You're talking about I 75 yeah. freeway. I-75 is an old native, old First Nations trail from up north Michigan. Because yeah, it goes north. north to south. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, freeways that end in odd numbers go north to south. Even numbers go east to west. OK, no, no. like I-94 uh, west, they, they go east to west. 75 north goes north and south. OK, so we're looking at the um, we're looking at the interstate highway, even though it ran through African American communities and destroyed African American daughter, even though it ran through African American communities and That's destroyed right. African American communities. Uh, but, but, but it has a it's like an ancient highway, it's like based upon an ancient highway, also, right? Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Now um you have uh some other class sessions uh the levant theory and ancient chemist connection with ancient kush uh the importance of the 18th dynasty uh nubian spiritual systems affect ancient chemist and christianity possible relationship to hindu uh the nubian kushite identity crisis in academia now i know one of the things and i'm gonna pull this up here because i know one of the things that you love to talk about is um uh, dealing with uh, uh, Amana Shikito, okay, oh, yeah. Queen Amana Shikito. And I know you love to talk about the Kandakis and uh, the African queens and uh, things like this, okay? So this is an article from uh, AtlantaBlackStar.com. I have one from Face to Face Africa. I can't find it. Um, I have to try to pull that up. But this is one from um, AtlantaBlackStar.com on um, Queen Amana Shikito. Uh, so tell so tell us uh, about her in, in the Kandakis. Aman Nit Shakito. Uh, Aman is, is the god Neat of the land of Ta. Okay, so that's okay. what her name means. Um, Aman Shakito. We we think now it now it's a monetary, but anyway, she was the one of these queens because there's still a little bit of you know debate which one it was, but we know one did. Um, she fought off the Romans coming into ancient Sudan. They never did come into the land of Meroe. They never did come into Sudan because Amana Kashito um, walked into the into uh, into uh, Augustus Caesar's um, encampment, which they came with thirty thousand soldiers um, to come and try to take over. Sudan, and she rode in between two elephants and told him, well, you can come in, but you're not going to leave out. Right. And so she came in and she sacked his camp, her and her um, troops sacked his camp, and they cut. They brought his bust of his, because they all, always would bring a statue of um, of the leader, and they post it in front of, the, in front of the, their camp, in front of his tent. And so she um, stole that, and she buried it under uh, the throne. Uh, the, the the throne, the step of her throne. So when she got on her throne, she could step on his face every time right. she got on her throne. This right. is the best story. This is this is the this is the the definition of badass sister to mm -hmm. me. And so, um, but whether it's a monetary or whether it's a Monica Shito, I think it's on page one fifty five of the African Civilizations um, book by Sheikh Hanter Jope. Okay. And, then, um, and the story is there where uh, Sheikh Hanter Jope. Um, tells that story so 
if you want to read that story over and over like I do, go to page 155 uh, and, and, and read that story because it's really, really, um, it's, it's, it tells. And Shea Cantor Jopes uh, was one of the first to say it, him and Chancellor Williams, that the antiquity of, of, of ancient Sudan is going to go farther back than the reach of human, uh, human history. Wow. Absolutely. Okay. So tell people once again, how they can register for your class, how they can get information and when your class starts up. My class is Monday, starts Monday, October 16th at 6.30 PM. Uh, we will have a Teams platform. We can have up to 300 people in the class. Uh, well, Mondays and Thursdays from 6.30 to 8.15. Probably allow yourself 8.30 just in case Q&A Q &A gets kind of hot. And we want to hear from there be no test, basically presentations, and you fill out um, you will fill out your question sheets from our discussion in class. And then at the end, the last two sessions, each of the students is going to present a paper on the subject that they want to research and that they want to talk about, um, like a three minute paper. So oh, three minute paper. Goes, okay. <laughs> okay. Teaching to the students teaching, and that's where I want to leave. Um, leave the ball in the laps of the students because it's very important that they come away with this knowledge. We can have discussion time. Um, they may bring me some information I've never heard of. You know what I mean? Right. So, you know, just, you know, as you say, you know, I, I know some things, but I'm not going to claim to know everything. And I do um, accept, you know, I, I love the discussion because sometimes the discussion portion of the classes can go far out there. We're going to make sure we keep it encapsulated to, to ancient Kush though. Okay. Um, okay. So email her at N Wartford, uh, the letter N Wartford, W A R D uh, F O R D at hotmail.com and the subject line put Kush K U S H course, uh, put that in the subject line and, uh, you can register for this class. And you're going to learn a lot. I've been to her, uh, been a few of her lectures over the years. We've had her here on the African History Network show uh, a number of times. So uh, this, this is a bad sister right here. You're going to be blown away uh, from uh, Sister Nubia Ward for the name of her class, Prehistory and History of Ancient Kush to the Meroitic uh, Queens. And she loves talking about the Kandakis and the African Queens. Um, and uh, they, they, they don't get talked about enough. I don't think they don't get yeah, talked yeah. about enough. Yeah, absolutely. And this and we'll is make, we'll make sure we talk about them well uh, in yeah. this course, because we want everybody to understand that these queens, these powerful queens ruled for 350 years. Mm -hmm. um, on top of the queens from ancient Egypt that don't get their propers, Nefertiti's right. wasn't just a beautiful face. There's a chapter in Kara Cooney's book. If you ever get to just get a chance to interview her, she's a good at interview, Kara Cooney. Um, okay. And she's a d director of archaeology, I think the director or chair of archaeology at UCLA. Um, you know, in her book, she really talks about that. Well, also, um, I'll also have uh, copies of a couple of pages from Dr. Ben, from Dr. Ashby, um, from uh, from from Dr. Um, from from Dr. Bonner, um, okay. Bonet, I'm sorry, um, and other things. So I'm going to share some literature with you, and I will have a pamphlet that I'll have created um, by the end of the class. That if people want to purchase it, they can purchase that um, for you know that my first book that Michael's been telling me. Um, to do for at least, uh, what, 15 years or so? Something like that. Yeah, I've been telling you to do your <laughs> books. And then I told you, put your lectures on DVD also. Yeah, and I, do it. I have, I have. So, uh -huh. yeah, so we, so, but we, we really uh, want to stress the importance of, uh, you know, each person, someone in each family being the family historian to tell yeah. the, the, or, the origins of your family and then connect them with how we got to this place right here. How do we get in these chairs that we're sitting in in Detroit, Michigan? What was our story? How did we get here? What was our family story? And then know that we had a history before them. I had the I had the misfortune, <laughs> I call it the misfortune, disfortune to hear a, a history uh, teacher uh, sit in front of a panel of people and say that you know the things in ancient Kemet and all that ancient Kemetic stuff doesn't have anything to do with us in the United States. I had to do everything, you know, people rush up, Nubia, you're going to say something. I said, I'm not on the panel. 
I'm not going to say a thing. Oh, I wish I was there, but okay. Yeah. So, so you know, <laughs> who, no, what was this? Who, who was this educated, she's a historian and she's one of the, one of the top historians in Detroit public schools. All right. And this is the kind of thing that's being said, a beautiful black woman, very, very, very prideful in being black, but what, just, what type of what type Just of history does she teach? I'm sorry. What type I of history? I don't know. She's a history consultant, which she's even more. It's more impactful because she's right. She's helping people write their curricula. She's helping people, you know, uh, put the content in their classes. So she's she's just not a teacher. She is one of the consultants that help decide what the students learn. And until we decide that it's very important to start off in pre uh you know uh you know maafa right european contact and then take it all the way down but then do it in a in a way where we're telling the story you know what i mean that there are so many aspects of our history that is just not spoken about i mean the from the medici family the the world bank gangsters you know what i'm saying mm -hmm. he was married to an african woman you know mm -hmm. so the medici family if you've ever looked at that medici exhibit that has the 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 first first skull of per, Pope Peter, which is Pope Pata in the Vatican, a brother they carrying his skull around today from place to place to place with this, and see the children of this mulatto family, that or mixed race family, mixed blood family from this African woman. She looks like she could have been either from like Guinea or Senegal in her hairstyle. She's definitely from West Africa, and all of those people are are black. And of course, you know, where were they from? Sicily, you know, the Southern, you know what I mean? The Southern right. people. Well, the Moors were intermixing with, with the Europeans, with the Sicilians, with the Italians. But that, the, and, I mean, we can call it Moors. This, woman was, this woman was straight up. When you see pictures ancient, the most, most, the, the most ancient picture or oldest picture I've seen of Moors, they had on African attire with big, oh, yeah. big Kenyan, necklaces and stuff their hair was african uh you know big earrings in there uh and and when we talk about the moors those are the moors we're talking about who busted the ass of, mm -hmm. of spain because they raped um Flori florida got raped and so she got a letter out. She was, you know, they the, the royalty sends their children around. So this is what this is under the Visigothic rule. Okay. Right. And this is why the Moors go in. That's uh, right. Because emissaries were sent in from uh, the Iberian Peninsula That's right. into Morocco to ask them to come and fight against the Visigoths. And they came over there and they whooped their butts and took yeah. it over for seven, eight, almost 800 years. Right. And because they were defending this, this little 13 year old princess that had been raped. Mm -hmm. And that's why the now now the brothers yeah yeah you know you better defend these sisters because that's the way you defend a, a sister that mm -hmm. you that you that you take a country away from those 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 vandals those rapists for yep. seven eight hundred years and that's and that's that's the kind of thing that we want to and and, and unless you know the history you're not going to have that kind of fervor that kind of empowerment. Mm -hmm. Um, that, you know, that pride to do something like that. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, we in Detroit, we standing around um, taking pitch video cameras while a, a sister had to jump off stage from her show and, and stop a fight of a brother beating up a sister right in front of her face. You right. know what I mean? That shouldn't have happened. You know what right. I mean? With, with, you know, I'm going off subject, but I'm just telling you, you know, the Morris folks wouldn't have had, that would not have happened under, you know, the Morris people came all the way from Africa to come in and beat their butt and, and keep it for a seven, eight hundred years. And that's why you have the bull run that happens every spring where the, the, the ceremony of the Spanish running the black, the big black brothers out of Spain. And that's where it comes from. OK, running with the bulls. Yeah. OK. OK. That's the origin of running with the bulls dealing with. OK. Uh, in Spain. And we see we see a lot of that when we look at uh, Joie de Piet, Black Pete and Center Class. Uh, center Class is now have the little children. OK, but yes. Center Class is the origin, part of the origin dinner with Santa Claus. Center Class is Dutch, which means St. Nicholas. 
And um, we know St. Nicholas is, is based upon Bishop Nicholas, who was a real person. And he was um, third, fourth century in uh, Myra, which is modern day Turkey. He was an African man, but he's mythologized and uh, center class had a red and white outfit. He had a sidekick named Black Pete, Joat de Piet, who was a Moor. OK. Mm -hmm. And they and this was celebrated. Joat de Piet, this was celebrated in Holland, in the Netherlands. And they still have the celebration uh, starting in early November uh, each year, running through to about December 6th of um, center class and Joat de Piet. And you have the these Europeans, they put on blackface and Afro wigs and they put on uh, costumes resembling uh, the Moors from like medieval time, and uh, and they they imitate Joat de Piet as well. And you, and you can uh, every uh, during Christmas season you start seeing stories coming out of Holland and people protesting against this. There's more and more protests each year against this because they're saying it's racist and things like this. But this goes uh, back to the history of the Moors in Spain, and the and th that celebration is starts with center class coming into the Netherlands on a steamboat and they say he's coming from Spain, which what the PA. Okay. So all this history takes us right back to African people. All right. Well, look, sister Nubia, it's always good talking to you. Um, people register for her class. You're going to learn a lot from her. Okay. As we well. Talk, we talk from, from ancient karma to, 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 to Christmas. How do we get there? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, yeah, Christmas and then that's it. And then Christmas that ties into the winter solstice, which ties into astronomy, which ties you into a sar or set in Heru and Heru being born on December 25th. All that is connected. Okay, all yeah, we're gonna talk about Father Time and Osiris and all that kind of thing yeah. um, in the class when we talk about the connections to Christianity as well as the iconography in the Christian church, which goes all the way back to to ancient Egypt, mushrooms, and all kinds of things. So it's just yep. a wonder. Uh, it, we really are going to explore Africa in the most African-centered, truth-centered way possible. There's not going to be any hyperbole, no racism. It is just going to be truth. Absolutely. I, I've seen some of her information dealing with the icon, uh, iconography and how um, ancient, she talks about how ancient Africa, especially ancient Kemet, is preserved within the iconography in the Christian church today. So that's going to blow away a whole lot of people, okay? <laughs> that's going to blow away a whole lot of people, a whole lot of saints when they see something like that, okay? All right, Sister Nubia. Well, look, it's always good talking to you. Peace, uh, peace to you and the family. Everybody register for her course, okay? All right. Thank you talk so much. All right, talk to you later, Sister. Peace. Hotel. Peace. All right, everybody, that was Sister Nubia Wardford. You've seen her a number of times here on the African History Network show. Uh, follow us here uh, on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network, my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P as well. Uh, be sure to visit uh, my website, also theafricanhistorynetwork.com. Now, we're updating our website. Um, you know, we're not on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF anymore, but the African History Network show continues because I was doing African History Network show before 9, 10 even came into existence. So go. Uh, so I'm got, I got to update this. I got to put another picture there. But we're going to be on uh, basically Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. This Sunday, we may start at uh, 8 p.m. I got so much content. I've been busy uh, and I haven't been able to do the show live on Sunday since I got the notification that uh, the radio station was shutting down. So it was fine with me. Uh, also, you know, register for my online history classes. We teach on Saturdays and Sundays. We got the information there as well. Uh, my lectures, uh, we have a, a lot of my lectures in digital download format. And we have a bundle pack. Now, this is the interview I did with uh, Tony Browder that I mentioned. Uh, we dealt with why now Valley civilization history matters. We talked about African Queens and the power of the media, et cetera. This is the interview I did with um, uh, Dr. Malefic Keti Asante, uh, who's at Temple University, Queen Cleopatra from J.D. Pinkett Smith, Arab Egyptian uh, backlash and anti-blackness. Um, and here's an interview I did with uh, one of my teachers, Professor Jane Small. 
Uh, we dealt with the woman king and the real history of the West African kingdom of Dahomey. But we have uh, my 15 lecture is a 15 lecture bundle pack of my lectures. African history awakens the African mind for mental death. It's in digital download format. OK, so that's on sale. You can check that out. You can as soon as you download that, you can start watching the content. That's on sale. Seventy five dollars. Uh, and then we have uh, some of my lectures here as well as uh, online classes and everything. If you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, uh, you can email me right through the website, contact the African History Network, or email me at uh, AHN show at uh, the African History Network.com, AHN show at the African History Network.com to. Uh, if you want me to do a presentation for your group or organization, or if you want to interview me on your show, uh, on your podcast, uh, or whatever it is, okay, email me uh, for that as well, and uh, we'll try to make that happen. All right, we uh, follow us on our Facebook fan page, The African History Network. Turn on live notifications so you know when we go live. Follow me on my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. Uh, turn on live notifications so you know when we go live. And uh, I'm on Instagram as well, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P, uh, on Instagram. All right, look, we have to get out of here. Remember the African History Network, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. Uh, Wakanda forever. Uh, also, you can support us through uh, Cash App and PayPal, dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App. And through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, that's on our website um, as well. And we have the, let me put the information up here. This helps us keep doing the research, stay on the air, keep broadcasting, pay some of the bills as well, pay for all these services that I use, upgrade equipment when we have to upgrade equipment. Uh, but we have that right on the homepage of our website also. When you scroll down and we have uh this is our official cash app account dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w when you go to it it'll say michael some of these other ones are fake african history network cash app accounts and i'm still trying to get them shut down because they've been stealing money from us so our tag is dollar sign the ahn show s-h-o-w i put our cash app tag right here when you click on it it shows you our qr code okay so you know this is us and then our paypal tag is there uh paypal link also all right we have to get out of here right now is correct wrong behavior it's not over till we win what you do for yourself what you do to yourself and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself what you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself what you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you read heard and seen about yourself right now is correct wrong behavior it's not over till we win we're kind of forever and we'll talk to you next time